Hi, I want to welcome you and, and thank you for streaming this message today. Uh, I'm really glad that you joined us. At Bailey Christian Church, it matters to us that you feel welcome, uh, like that this is family. Uh, whether you're young or not so young, uh, my hope is that you'll encounter Jesus and that as you encounter Jesus, you'll find encouragement to live a, a life of faith for Him. If you're new with us today, I would love if you would mind uh, filling out the Connect card uh, that is linked here or going to baileychristianchurch.com and uh, letting us know uh, who you are, uh, if you have any questions that we can follow up with, uh, or even if you have uh, a prayer concern and you'd like somebody to pray for you, uh, we'd love to know so that we can connect with you. If you're in the area sometime, in the Bailey area, we'd love to have you join us in person. And the reason I invite you into that uh, is because we're called not just to experience a, a message, but actually to live a life of faith in the context of community. And, and so we'd love for you to, uh, to be a part of what's happening here at Bailey. And if you want to know more about how you can get plugged in uh, to what's happening here, uh, again, go back to baileychristianchurch.com, check things out. And if we can help you, we would love to follow up with you as well. I hope today that you're blessed through this message. That's why we had to make the aisle wider here. This is... No. Actually, when, just to let you know, we, didn't, we weren't trying to you know, create more of, a, uh, of an entrance, but uh, when, when Levi showed me a picture, hey, I got this, this thing, I think this would be a, a nice stand. It was half of this. And so we got a really good deal on something twice as big. So. <laughs> And here's what it means for you, is that I can spread out far more notes. Uh, I hope you've got a couple hours here today. Um, you know, we are uh, uh, continuing through our, our series on Know the Story, Live the Story, and we have, we've covered a lot of territory, and we're now into the early church. Uh, we've talked about Jesus' ascension and the Holy Spirit coming down and the birth of the church. And in the early chapters of Acts, if you've ever read the book of Acts, if you haven't, I, I invite you to do that. That's a, a, a great read because it's the, some, uh, in, in, the, in the ancient world, it was referred to as Acts or the Acts of the Apostles. But many have said, no, it's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit is doing or did in the life of and through the, the early church. Well, we come to um, a, a real pivotal turning point in uh, in the church's history up to this point. Remember that Jesus had said, you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes and you receive power, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the other parts of the world. It, it's like a ripple, like a, a, a drop of water as it kind of ripples out. The problem is, in many ways, that they had really just stayed concentrated in Jerusalem. They hadn't really moved out much beyond that. And God is going to going to do something unique in what happens in this, in this season of the church to actually bring the church out into the world, but not in the way that they had surely intended or, or, or hoped for. Sometimes God uses a dramatic conversion to turn not only a life around, but, but a, a church, the world around. One of those um, conversions is C.S. Lewis. Uh, he's a, a great Christian thinker and an author of the last uh, century, British. But he was, a, um, as some would say, was a militant atheist. He was a, a decorated professor at Oxford, a deep thinker. And as one person put it, the last thing that he wanted was to be converted. And then Bruce Larson says, God sneaks up on Lewis, and Lewis is surprised by joy. In fact, Lewis goes on to say, I'm dragged kicking and screaming, the most reluctant convert in all the world, into the kingdom. 
Now, some of us grew up in the church, and so that was not and would never be our experience. But there are others that, that start out very far from the Lord. In fact, if anything, they're antagonistic toward the Lord. But little do they know is that God had other intentions for them. And that's going to be the story that we're going to read about when we look at Saul today. You see, up to this point in the book of Acts, the church is growing. It's multiplying. In fact, they've really kind of developed a, a, a respect among many of the people in the Jewish community. But there was also a lot of antagonism that was beginning to develop. The apostles had been arrested and flogged up to this point. And it was almost as if the, uh, the tinder was being piled up and all it would take was a spark, one bit of light to, to get that flame going. And that's exactly what happens in the, in the story of Stephen. Now, you may have read about Stephen in chapter 6 and chapter 7 of, of Acts. Um, Stephen is a man of faith. He's a man of great wisdom. He's a man of, of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. He was a God through him worked miracles and, and, and many wonders. He's articulate. He's able to defend his faith. In fact, that's where we, we come into the, the problem in chapter 6 and chapter 7 is that he is, he is de- debating with a group of Jews about the truth of Jesus and about the, that he's the Messiah, that he really had raised from the dead, and, and that things were changing, that, that Jesus was bringing a new covenant into play. The problem is the Jewish community that didn't believe that was, was very opposed to the idea. They, they, they thought it blasphemy. And, but they couldn't stand up against Stephen's debating. He was really, God had given the ability uh, to articulate very well. And so they did like they did with Jesus, and they brought in false witnesses. And they brought him before the Sanhedrin, that is the Jewish leading group. And they, and he basically, they basically said that he's, he's committing blasphemy against Moses and against God. He's speaking against things, against the temple, and, and, and he needs to die. So Stephen, in the midst of this, becomes the first martyr of the early church. And a rage, a mob raised up. They picked up stones and they stoned Stephen. And then we are introduced to an important character by the name of Saul. And it says that the, in the midst of the stoning, Saul was there and they, people laid their coats or their cloaks at his feet as they went to pick up a stone to stone Stephen. And somehow in the midst of that experience, this passionate zeal welled up within Saul. And he, he, he created a rampage against the people of God. In fact, he, he got paper so that he could go from house to house and have uh, Christians arrested in Jerusalem and dragged and put into to prison and potentially either beaten or, or put to death. And so a great persecution broke out against the church and Christians fled Jerusalem, except for the apostles. The apostles remained right there in Jerusalem. And as many of the Jewish believers fled Jerusalem, it appears that Saul decided he would go after some of them. And so that's where we pick up our story in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. If you want to follow along, or if you want to look up on the, the screen, you can do that as well. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went to the high priest, and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now let's do a little background on Saul. Saul was from Tarsus. Now, Tarsus was a very ancient city, but also a, a city with great intellectual influence. It had a combination of east and west, and, and it was one of those cities where lots of deep thinking and, and Roman and Greek thinking was going on. And Saul actually was born a Roman citizen. He's Jewish, but he was also born a Roman citizen, which is a big deal in the ancient world because in order to become a Roman citizen, if you weren't born one, you had to pay a pretty good deal of money in order to purchase your citizenship. But it may very well have been, in part, why God chose Saul to begin with. Because Saul understood the Greek and Roman world, as well as the Jewish world. Saul, um, in fact, will go on. Eventually, you'll know Saul as Paul. 
It doesn't indicate why his name changes. Probably what's likely is that Paul is his Roman name. So that you get a sense of later on that Paul has a missionary mindset. But up to this point, that's not the case. And so he, he knows both the Jewish world and he knows the Roman world. He is able to travel freely as a Roman citizen, but he's also able to enter into the synagogues and to minister there. In fact, at a young age, Saul left Tarsus and ended up in Jerusalem to study. And he studied under, at the feet of uh, the, maybe the best-known rabbi of the time, Rabbi Gamaliel. Well, his name will come up uh, in the book of Acts as well. And so that's the background that leads into where we're at with, with Saul. And so Saul gets papers from the high priest in order to go to Damascus. Now, Damascus is about 150 miles northeast of Jerusalem. There's tens of thousands of Jews that are, are present there, and so it's a significant city. There's a number of synagogues in that, uh, in that city. In fact, it is the, the oldest continually, continuously occupied city in the world, I believe. Or it's one of the oldest. I mean, it may not be the oldest, but it's one of the oldest. continues to be uh, lived in even uh, to this day. And he got papers in order to take them as prisoners. Now, you have to understand, prison wasn't the end. You didn't get a, a sentence that, that said, for the next 10 years, you're going to be in prison. Prison was a holding place. You went to prison to go to trial. Either you would be found innocent and released, or you'd be found guilty of something and beaten, or you'd be found guilty and put to death. I mean, those were your options. Prison wasn't the, the, the punishment. It was the holding place for what was to come. And so he gets papers in order to, to arrest people, he says, that are, that are part of the way. Now, it's interesting, the first description that we have of that word being used, and it may have been that, that, uh, that, the, that some of the early Jewish Christians gave themselves that name. Whether that's a reference to when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, so that they are followers of him, or that they are, they are followers of the true way that God had intended. Uh, either way, I'm sure that that's not the best selling point when you're Jewish, telling the rest of the Jewish community, well, we're part of the way. I'm not sure about you guys, you're a wayward, but we are, we are part of the way. And so uh, he would go into Jer to Damascus in order to find these Christians and bring them back. So let's go to verse 3. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. I mean, only Jesus can do this kind of stuff. Here's this guy who radically wants to stamp out Christianity, who's turned from darkness to light. In fact, Saul encounters here the resurrected Jesus. And he sees this light. And if you know from the Old Testament and other times even the New Testament, when God shows up, light is often involved, this brightness, this glory of God. In fact, Jesus on uh, the Mount of Transfiguration is transfigured into this brilliant light in front of Peter, James, and John. And so it makes sense that he would do something very similar to that here. And Jesus says, Saul, Saul. Now, in the Old Testament, when God was trying to get somebody's attention, he might repeat it a couple of times as basically saying, I, I, I really mean it. I want you to pay attention. This is for you. And so he calls Saul. And his question is, why, do you, why are you persecuting me? Now, Saul's clueless. He goes, um, who are you? And how is it that I'm persecuting you? He doesn't exactly understand. He doesn't know who Jesus is in this moment. He doesn't recognize him. But here's what Jesus says, is it's me that you're persecuting. Now, what's fascinating is that, at least by Paul's stance, he's not intending to persecute Jesus. He's, in persecuting, he's persecuting the followers of Jesus. But it's almost as if Jesus says, wait a second, wait. You mess with my people, you mess with me. In fact, Jesus would tell his disciples earlier, by the way, when they persecute you, it's not really you they're persecuting, but it's me that they're rejecting. 
And so it also shows us how closely tied Jesus is to the body of Christ. The church is referred to as the body of Christ. That is, that it is we are Jesus' representation here on, on the earth in the meantime. And so there is a, there is a deep connection between the church and Jesus. Well, this had to blow Saul's mind because in Saul's mind, he thought this whole Christianity thing was a fraud. He's deeply committed to Judaism. And when he hears about this Jesus who was supposed to be a Messiah, but he was put to death on a, on a criminal's cross, he's going, that, that can't be. He doesn't buy into any of this stuff. And then all of a sudden, he is dramatically encountered by this Jesus that he just thought was nothing. A dead Messiah on the cross was not a good Messiah. But a resurrected Messiah, that, that's a whole different game. And so he has a dramatic conversion. Now, some people will say that Saul was converted on the road to Damascus. And I'd say, I think it's a, a better way to describe it as his transformation begins there, but it awaits Jesus sending someone to explain further to Saul. It's not done. This conversion is not done. So let's look at verse 7. Well, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They, they heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. And so they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now, Paul's companions, that is, he brought with him, I'm, I'm assuming, a contingent of, of the temple guards and soldiers who would be able to help him uh, do the, the arresting. And they heard the voice, but they didn't see Jesus. Now, after this, Paul can't see. So he encounters Jesus in the midst of this glorious, bright light, and afterward he is left blind, which is a real powerful imagery. That the reality is that Paul was blind before that encounter. And now Jesus is making it clear, you really don't get it just yet. And so I'm going to allow you to feel the experience of what it is to not see. It, it's almost as if to say, for the next three days, I'm going to give you a big grown-up time out so you can think about <laughs> what you've been doing. And he's fasting. Uh, in, in other words, he's, he's doing what a good Jew would do in the midst of, of the turmoils of life, and he's, he's not eating. I can't imagine he probably had a desire to eat anyway, but I can only imagine that in the midst of this, he's questioning and he's crying out to God and trying to, trying to put two and two together. And so now we come down to verse 10, and we see God is, the, the, that the Lord is not done with this process. So in, in verse 10, it says, In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. And the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. He tells Ananias to go to Judas is not, not Judas that you might think of. Judas was a very, a very popular name, and so there were other Judas. Probably not after that, but uh, during that generation, there were a lot of Judases. And so Judas lived on Straight Street. Now, let me show you this. This is a, an actual picture, uh, modern-day Damascus, and that is the street. And it's called Straight Street because... It is exactly what it means. It is a straight street, kind of the main street of town. And so you get a sense that even today, that is, uh, here's what's amazing to me, is that these are real people in real places in real time. This is not a made-up story. Uh, this is the, the story of what God really did in the midst of history to bring people to him. And that's a real city that exists even today. That's where Saul was for those three days. Let's go down to verse 13. Lord, Ananias answered. <laughs> it's kind of like, are you sure? Have, have, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. You, you do know that, God, right? But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. 
This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Jesus sends Ananias in the midst of a vision. And then he confirms that by saying, oh, by the way, just in case you weren't sure about it, I've actually told Saul you're coming. So he's expecting you. And as you can imagine, though, Ananias is not so so sure about this, but Jesus simply says, go. And then he shares with him what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to share with him the calling I have on his life. And so I want you to let Saul know that he's going to be my witness to the Gentiles, that's to the non-Jewish world, and to their kings, and also to Israel. Oh, and by the way, I want you to let him know how much he's going to suffer for my name. Now, I just I want to, you know, ask you, if, if that was your calling, how excited would you be to say, sign me up for that? Pain, more, please, more pain. So this is a, it's amazing, uh, an amazing call, and we're going uh, we're, we're gonna to see more about it. Let's go to verse 17. And then Ananias went to the house, and he entered it. And placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. That's amazing how uh, warmly Ananias interacts with and confronts Saul, and he calls him brother. And he shares what Jesus had told him, you know, I've been sent to heal you. Uh, I've been sent so that you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, with power now to, to do the mission that, that God has uh, uh, ordained for you. And so after that, he, he did. He, he touched him. Uh, his, it was like scales or something fell from the eyes of Saul so that he could see again. He ate something. He, he went and got baptized. And this conversion was, I say complete, but, but now the, the transformation was beginning. And then let's continue on. We'll finish up here, go down to verse 22. And so Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And at once he began to preach in the synagogues. Now, the synagogues, by the way, in, this, in Jerusalem is the temple. That's the main gathering place where sacrifices and all of that would take place on special feast days and, and other days. But the synagogues were kind of local, what would you think of as local churches, where, where the, the Jewish people would gather for prayer, for teaching, for, for community. And so at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now remember what he was going to the synagogues to do. Can you imagine how people would have reacted going, we've heard that he was coming, but not for this reason. Is he serious? Is, is this just a ploy? And all those who heard him were astonished, and they asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on the, this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? You can imagine this, this must have blown their minds too. Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews during living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Right away, Paul goes to the heart of, of the Jewish people and he begins to, to proclaim that Jesus is the promised one. Now, Paul will say later that Jesus himself gave him the testimony, that Jesus himself taught him things. So I don't know if some, some of that would have happened in those three days uh, awaiting. Uh, I don't know if that happened uh, separately or at, at other times. But uh, Saul was already uh, downloaded with some information. The other thing is he was a skilled Jewish scholar. So he knew the Old Testament. It's almost, it's not almost, but it was as if the, the Holy Spirit had opened his eyes to see now the, the Old Testament in a whole different light and begin to realize, oh, that's what that means. Oh, that points to Jesus. Oh, that's Jesus. And so right away, he's able to give a defense for who this Jesus is. And you realize that God knew what he was doing when he picked Saul. This, this one who, who it was worldly in the sense that he understood the Roman and Greek culture and who was deeply rooted in the Jewish traditions and, and scriptures so that he's the perfect one to become the missionary to the world beyond Jerusalem. 
Well, this morning, in the, in the time we have left, I want to I reflect a little bit on some things from this passage. It's, it's, it's really more of a kind of a general reflection. It's rather than three things tied to something else. In fact, it's, it's four. Your paper says five. Um, so I've scaled it back from five and forgot to change that on your paper. So it's four. You're going, where's the fifth one? So I don't want you to lose sleep over that. But it's actually four. Four lessons we're going uh, to take a look at from this conversion of Saul. And the first is this. Even though someone sincerely believes something to be right, they may be sincerely wrong. See, no one was more passionate for doing God's work than Saul, but he was, he was wrong. The Bible says that zeal without knowledge is, I'm going to add this part, is dangerous. I mean, that's, a, that's mob mentality. These are people that are worked up, that are passionate about something, and they believe in it. It's just that what they believe in is not true. Now, the reason this matters is because we live in a culture in which people essentially say, well, if you, if you really believe it and it's true for you, then that's, that's enough. But would we say that that would be accurate in Saul's case? So if he truly believed that he was doing the Lord's bidding when in fact he was actually an enemy of the Lord, would it have been okay to say, but he, but he means well? And Jesus said, no, that's, no, that's not enough. Yet you may have been ignorant, I understand that, but what you're doing is wrong. And so I think it's important for us to say, um, in a culture, to, to, to push back in a loving way, not a harsh way, but a loving way to say that just because somebody believes something firmly doesn't make it true. The second lesson is that though Jesus could do all the evangelism himself, he includes human agents in the process. It's amazing to me that Jesus encounters Saul, but the, the, the work isn't done yet. In fact, it's not done until he brings Ananias into the picture. And that, that may be, you know, sometimes our thing. Well, God's God. He could bring anybody to salvation that he wants. He could do anything that he, that he wants. And yet, he's called us to be agents in that process. And so we don't get to pawn that off on God. God says, I've invited you into this journey. I've given you the mission of speaking on my behalf. Yes, I could do a lot of things without human agents, but that's not how I choose to do this. And so Ananias is one of those, as we are also one of those agents called to be his voice to the people around us. The third lesson is Saul's conversion is another proof of the reality of Jesus' resurrection. If you're looking for proofs of whether Jesus really rose from the dead, Saul's a great example. I mean, he was adamantly opposed to this message. He was adamantly opposed to Jesus and to his teaching and to the, the church. And dramatically overnight, something happened. Now, some people have tried to explain uh, Saul's conversion as, well, I mean, it's psychological. Maybe he just felt guilty. And he, so he, he had kind of a, um, a, a vision that was kind of welled up from within him. And he felt bad about that, and he turned around. But there's no indication that he feels bad about what he's doing. He feels very strongly about what he's doing. And so that just doesn't hold water. I think what Charles Spurgeon, the, uh, the old Baptist preacher from the 1800s, Great Britain, said the most useful members of a church are usually those who would be doing harm if they were not doing good. That Paul is one of those that was passionately opposed to God, but you redirect that passion and boy, just look out. Some of the greatest preachers and missionaries of the world have been people who were at one point heading in a very opposite direction. And, and Jesus redirected their pathway, pathways. And he channeled that energy and that passion for his glory. Now, here's the other thing, is that just as Saul's testimony is a powerful indicator of the resurrection of Jesus, so is yours. Now, I know some of you are going, but I don't have a dramatic conversion story like that. Well, uh, nobody does. Only Saul has that particular story. But your story is unique to you. And so you don't have to feel bad about whatever your story is. You didn't have to have been a, a, a drug addict on the, you know, the streets of some uh, 
inner city in order to come to Christ and have a dramatic story that way. Some of you grew up in the church and you just always knew Jesus. Well, that's a story a lot of people need to hear too, that that's possible. That you can raise children who will love Jesus and continue to love Jesus even after they grow into adulthood. So here's the point. Your story is a powerful testimony because what can somebody else say? I mean, there may be things that you don't know exactly how to prove out, and I understand that there's sometimes passages and concepts that somebody may ask you about. I, I don't have a good answer for that, but what I can tell you th- is this. It's like the blind man in the, in the book of John. All I can tell you is this. I was blind, and now I can see. In fact, I think that's Saul's story. I was blind, and now I can see, and so I want to let you know that your story is important In fact, Saul's story also indicates something else. It's a good reminder that we should never write somebody else off. You see, it's easy to dismiss the possibility of the worst of the worst ever coming to faith. This this guy, this gal, never, never followed Jesus. But God may actually be preparing to use that very enemy of the cross for his purposes. But it might also be a good reminder for some of us, some of us here today, may be that Saul. Some of you may may have never really stepped across the line, but you're held back by the the chains of of the sin of your past. And the thought would be, yeah, that's true for other people, but not for me. In fact, I think that would be part of Saul's testimony is that God chose me the worst of all sinners to be his apostle. And so Saul's message for you, if you feel like or if you know somebody who's written themselves off from the ability to be saved because of all that they've done, look at Saul. And his message is, if he can save me, he can save you. Let's look at the fourth lesson. And that is this, that the call to follow Jesus comes at a cost. Jesus says that himself. He says, if you're going to follow me, Pick up your cross and follow me. But here's why I want to highlight this, is that Saul's suffering was not due to his past sins, but it was as a result of his positive follow, his calling or following of Jesus. Here's why that matters. It can be very common for Christians to question why they're suffering or even being persecuted. And while there are sometimes different reasons, sometimes we're suffering because we've, we've made bad choices and and that can can happen because we have stumbled into something. Um, but sometimes we, we are suffering and, and we, we've done something in the past and we think that somehow maybe this is God paying us back. And I just want to say that's, that's not the case. And particularly in Saul, I mean, Saul's a good example that he was actually called and part of his calling was to suffer for Christ. And it's a reminder that in the modern church, with its, for some, in some regions of the, of the Christian realm, there is this focus on health and wealth. And I can't understand for the life of me how you can get that teaching if you look at the life of Saul. Because the, under, the assumption of the health and wealth gospel is that you, if you walk in authority in the power of Jesus, the power of the Spirit, then you'll walk in health and wealth and, and you'll kind of walk above all of that. And Saul is a dismissive to all of that. He said, what are you talking about? I was called to suffer. It wasn't because I lacked faith. It was because I had faith in the one who called me. And so I just want to encourage you that if we're faithful followers of Jesus, we can expect struggles. So we don't have to be surprised or shocked by them. In fact, so Saul would never be shocked then when when the pain came his way because he knew that was part of it. Now, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, as I mentioned, Jesus said that the calling of the church was to begin in Jerusalem, go to Judea, Samaria, and the other parts of the the world. But they really hadn't done that. And it may have been that they were possibly growing comfortable right there in Jerusalem. That was was home base. And it was almost as if that God was going to say that the the only way I'm going to get my people out is that I'm going to have to bring some, some or allow some pain to come their way. It was Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, about 200 A.D., who said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. 
You take a look at nations today like China. When the revolution took place in China, part of the revolution's goal was to wipe out the church, to imprison or kill pastors, to close the church doors. And so they really thought um, they had done their deed. They had squashed scripture. They had squashed Christian faith. They had squashed any, uh, um, uh, I say rebellion, but any resistance. And then I think it was around the 19, uh, 1990s, early 2000s, that we actually started to get numbers about the, the church in China. And we realized that rather than dying out, the church in China exploded underground, behind closed doors. That even as some of their pastors were killed, the church lived on because it wasn't the pastor who was the head of the church, it was Jesus that was the head of the church. And the church continued on. And it was actually in light of, in spite of, and maybe because of their, their persecution that the church just began to explode. So understand this, that while we don't say, hey, bring it on, <laughs> I want more pain. It may very well be that Jesus has used the struggles to actually grow people and to grow the church and to lead people. Because as C.S. Lewis puts it, that it is in our good times and as if God whispers. But it is in our struggles, in our tough times, that, that God shouts like a trumpet call. And so in the midst of a world that is broken, even in some of the worst places in the world today, and we're called to suffer along with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and to pray for them and to pray that they would be released, but to pray that they would be faithful so that the church would continue to grow even in the midst of its persecution. Well, with that as our backdrop, it's a good lead into communion because communion is in many ways about suffering. It's, a, it's central to that. It's a reminder both of the suffering of Jesus, but it's also a sharing in his suffering along with all who suffer now for their faith and all who've gone before. That as we gather for communion, we declare the death of Jesus until he comes. But we remember the mark of that, of the implications of that cross in our own lives. And in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, the writer of Hebrews says something that, that he's not speaking specifically about communion, but I think, it, I, I think it applies. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, if you've read, Genesis, or if you've read Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews 11 is kind of the hall of fame of faith. It talks about these great... Uh, people of faith from the Old Testament and how God worked through them. And so he's kind of, he's, he's, it's almost as if he's in a stadium and he's pointing out, look up there, there's Moses up there and there's Noah and, and, and there's David. And the image is, now he says, as we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, as we're, we're on the, the, the field of play, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart." I want you to picture communion then as not only us, but those who have gone before us gathered. And they are watching and they are cheering us on. And Saul or Paul is in the audience too. Or he's in the, he's in the crowd saying, you can do it. Stay true to Jesus. This morning as we come to communion after I pray, uh, you're invited to join with us. Uh, you don't have to be a member here, but if you're a Christian, uh, we invite you to be a, a part of this. If you're, if you're not a Christian, we invite this as a time for you to kind of reflect and, and think through what maybe your next steps would be. But we'd love to talk to you after the service about, about those steps if you're ready to, to take them just as Saul did that day. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you set the, the way before us. You were the, 
the author and the perfecter and that we are following in your example so that even as Saul was called to, to suffer for your name, it wasn't because you didn't understand what that was. You understood very intimately what suffering was like. But we thank you for the life of, of, of Saul. We thank you for the life of those who have gone before us, who have been models for us. And as we gather at this communion table, we, we long for the day and we'll, we'll actually get to share with those same saints of faith around that table. And we pray that we will be that for others, that we will cheer others on both now and when we are gone, that until that time comes in which you come home and you take us home. And so we pray your, your blessing on this meal. Uh, we pray your, your blessing on all who partake, that we would grow to look more and more like you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, I'm Joel Malone, one of the elders here at Bailey Christian Church. We are so glad you joined us online today. Thank you for streaming on whatever platform you're using. Uh, just remember to drop us a note and let us know that you are here and watching, and we would love to have you visit us in person sometime. Our doors are always open. If you have any needs or prayer concerns, uh, just go to our website and uh, check us out there. Send us a message, and uh, we'd be happy to be in contact with you. Have a great week. Thank you.